Thank you for listening to the History of the Papacy. I'm Steve, your host, and we are a member of the Agora Podcast Network. We are on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find both by searching for A2Z History. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, you can always send me an email to my email address, steve at a2zhistorypage.com. I'm really looking forward to your questions for the Q&A episode that will be coming up very soon. We have a lot of thanks today, so I want to start off with a thanks to Bridget for her really kind email and generous donation through PayPal. I'd also like to thank Otto for his generous PayPal donation. My thanks and appreciation go out to Justin for sending me a book from my Amazon wish list on Carl Jung in the Bible. I've wanted to explore this topic more after I did an episode on the hero's journey and dreams for Beyond the Big Screen. I've really become interested in the topic. I also have to thank Paolo for sending me two great books on the Synoptic Gospels and the Q source. Gary Stevens and I are planning an episode or two on these topics, which I'm really excited about, and these books will be very helpful. A lot of thanks today, and I just have to say I very, very much appreciate all of your help and support. Like I said, keep in mind your keep uh, sending in those questions for the upcoming Q and A episode. It's been far too long since we've had one of these. I'm especially looking for your questions on the church music and art, which are topics I haven't spent nearly enough time on. I also will quickly mention today, and I'll do a bigger rollout on this, is that I'm now on the Himalaya podcast. Uh, platform. It's another great platform for you to access podcasts. They have a really great app you can use. They also have a way that you can become a monthly subscriber to the History of the Papacy where you'll get some bonuses like video feeds, early episodes with without ads, a lot of the things that we had on Patreon. So I would highly ch- recommend you checking that out by going to Himalaya.com and searching for the History of the Papacy. You can look in the show notes for more information on that. Now to the topic at hand. Today we have an episode on a really important figure in early church history named Jacob Bardais, who was extremely pivotal in his time, but doesn't get much coverage in church history from a Western perspective, which you will soon see why. If you want a multimedia experience, we have a video for this episode on our YouTube partner Nick Barksdale's study of Antiquity in the Middle Ages YouTube channel. Listen to the episode and then watch it on YouTube. It's a win-win. Now, thank you as always for your support and enjoy the episode and definitely send in your questions and I will talk to you soon. Welcome back. Today we're going to do another quick survey of what's going on and what was going on in other parts of the Christian world at that at the same time we're basically talking about in the era of the dark ages if you will. All too often, I have to skim over or entirely skip some really interesting bits of history of the church. Sometimes small pieces of history can make a big difference later on. And that's the case with the topic of today's episode, Jacob Bardais. He is one such person who didn't quite fit into the narrative of previous episodes, but this humble monk who lived thousands of miles from Rome set off a series of events that would make an enormous difference after his times. We will look at the life of Jacob Bardais and why he was so important not only to the history of Christianity, but also the popes of Rome. Let's talk a little bit about the background and context of Jacob's life. He was born sometime in the late 400s or early 500s in the area of south-central Turkey near the border with modern-day Syria. The place went by the name of Constantia or Tal Malzalt, which is modern-day Virnashir, Turkey. 
The difference in place names is going to be important here. We're talking about a Greek Roman idea versus Syriac. Now, Jacob was born to a Syriac family. He was the son of a priest uh, named Theophilus Barmanu. The name, his name would have been Jacob Bar Theophilus or Jacopos Bar Theophilus. In Syriac, he was known as more Yacoub Bar Dolono. Bardeus is the Greek Greco Latin corruption of Bordaono. Board Ono in Syriac is um, a word for saddlecloth, and I apologize for any butchering of the Syriac language I do here, but um, that word Board Ono is Syriac for saddlecloth, which Jacob wore for his clothing. Now, a saddlecloth, for you um, not in the know, is a rough, heavy garment that sits under the saddle. This was Definitely not a high-status, fashion garment by any stretch of the imagination. It was the garment of an ascetic monk. The name meant to convey the idea of Jake, something like Jacob the Poor. Now let's talk about Syriacs and Greeks, or Syriacs and Greco-Romans. This area of southern Turkey, Syria had um, an influence, was heavily influenced by the native Syriacs along with the Greeks and Roman culture. Syriacs are a distinct group. They are a distinct culture from Arabs, Greeks, and Romans. They had their own language, Syriac, which is a branch of the Semitic languages. Uh, think related languages like Arabic, Hebrew, Coptic, etc., and was a uh, descendant of the Aramaic language, the language of Jesus. At one time, these Aramaic and Syriac languages were the lingua franca of the Middle East and beyond. Most Syriacs were Monophysite Christians at this time. Late in the 400s, early 500s, the Christians of the Roman Empire split into these two Camps, the Monophysites and the Chalcedonians. There was another camp, the Nestorians, but we'll get into them in a moment. This is a very long story, but I'll cut it short with a few key details. There was an important council in the Asia Minor, minor city of Chalcedon in 451. Mainstream Roman imperial Christianity broke into two groups. Like I said, there was a third group, the Nestorians, but they had broken off at a previous council, the Council of Ephesus in 431. The Monophysites believed that Jesus had one nature, a united human and divine nature, and they rejected the formulation of Chalcedon. Now, the other group, the Diophysites or Diophysites, more commonly called Chalcedonians, they believe that Jesus had two separate but indivisible natures. He is both entirely human and entirely divine. These groups, the Diophysites, accepted the formulation of the Council of Chalcedon, so you can see why they got this name, Chalcedonians. Both the Monophysites and Chalcedonians rejected two important ideas that were floating around at that time. They both rejected something called Eutychianism. And this is a belief where Jesus had one divine nature that completely subsumed or cast over his human nature. Another idea was Nestorianism, which basically said that Jesus had two divided natures, one human and one divine. Nestorianism was popular in and around the area of the Middle East where Jacob Aradeus lived and preached. The difference between Nestorian, Chalcedonian, Monophysite, Eutychian were all very slim. And really, they used a lot of very detailed philosophical and theological and Aristotelian and Platonic arguments and semantical differences. I mean, generally, for us, they're minute differences, but obviously there are huge differences when you get down to the nitty gritty, especially in this theological debate, which would turn into a political debate. Here's the general geographic fault lines for these Monophysites and Chalcedonians. There was a fair amount of overlap, but we can say these pretty safely in broad strokes. 
Egypt, for we can start there, was almost entirely Monophysite, especially among the people. There would be some in the higher ranks, especially amongst the Greco-Romans, who would maintain the Chalcedonian formulation, but overall Egypt Monophysite. Western Europe and North Africa were almost entirely Chalcedonian, with the exception of North Africa that had a sprinkling of Aryan Christians along with Spain with the sprinkling of Aryans. The, that was more of the issue in the Western Empire, but they had very little or nothing to do with these arguments. The area around Constantinople and Eastern Europe Thrace, etc., were fairly solidly Chalcedonian, with Constantinople having some monophysites in it. Now, the Middle East, think modern-day Israel, Palestine, Syria, eastern Turkey, the Levant, and the northern bit of Saudi Arabia, was a mixed Chalcedonian and monophysite area. Your Greeks and Romans were predominantly Chalcedonians, where the Syriacs and the Arabs were predominantly Monophysites, and with the sprinkling, I should say, of other groups like the Aryans and the Subordinationists and just about any other group you could think of were in there, but we're still going to focus in on this Chalcedonian Monophysite division, with the exception that Mesopotamia, the area of more or less modern-day Iraq, was Nestorian and Monophysite. Nestorians more so, more heavily concentrated in the east into Persia, whereas the Monophysites were more to the west. But there was a mixture throughout. There was some Monophysites in Persia as well, even though the Nestorian ideal would catch on more in Persia. In the early 500s, Monophysitism was on the ropes. It was strong in Egypt and parts of the Middle East among the people, but Constantinople was able to appoint Chalcedonian bishops to almost every important see by the time of Justinian, who was a strong Chalcedonian. Now, there was a failure of a compromise position called the Henoticon, which tried to smooth over the differences between these two groups. Basically, Roman emperors and later Eastern Roman empires had one thing they wanted to do, and they wanted to make sure that they were always making everybody happy. They didn't want these big fissures in religion because that always led to fights and division and left the empire weakened. That's why these positions like the Henoticon, which more or less said Let's not talk about this difference between the two religious factions. Let's just not let's just not talk about the religious differences between our two factions. It didn't work. Jacob Baradeus comes back in the story when he was given over to a nearby monastery near his home and for a young at a young age. Sources say Jacob was an incredibly pious and faithful young person, even at his youngest age. We don't know exactly why he was put into a monastery at that young age. It could have been that the parents saw that he was incredibly pious and faithful, and that would be the place for him. It also could have been plague and all the usual reasons why parents might have to give up their children. We just don't know. We do know that he was a great student, and he mastered both Syriac and the Greek language. And that put him into a really good position to effectively argue the major theological controversies of the time, having a foot in both of those intellectual traditions and linguistic traditions. Jacob went to Constantinople in the late 520s, and he fell in with the Empress Theodora. If you don't know much about Theodora, she was the wife of Justinian. She, while Justinian was a strong Chalcedonian, his wife Theodora was not. She was strongly swayed by the Monophysite position. Theodora was a Syrian by birth, and her father was a priest who was a Monophysite and supported the Monophysites. Theodora 
strongly supported Monophysites throughout Constantinople. The Empress Theodora, with several exiled and imprisoned Monophysite bishops, and with the support of the Ghassanid Arab, Arab Ghassanid king, worked to get Jacob Bardeus made bishop in the 520s era. Jacob was consecrated as a bishop of Edessa, a city in the Middle East, but really was the Monophysite bishop of the Middle East at large, which was an odd situation. A, this Monophysite group really wasn't in the position to appoint bishops, but you could debate that, canonically speaking. Traveling or itinerant bishops at large was not exactly canonical either. The 15th canon of the Council of Nicaea spoke against traveling and itinerant bishops and priests. Bishops and priests were supposed to be attached to one geographical area, and they weren't supposed to bop around to different places or go into different areas. A bishop was supposed to be of his city and his place. No matter what, Jacob Bardeus took his position as a roving bishop really seriously. Accounts have him crisscrossing all over the Middle East and even into the islands of the Mediterranean. Even if we account for some exaggeration, these are some serious travels here. He appointed or consecrated, now this is a serious list, two patriarchs, the highest level in the hierarchy of Christianity. There was only five major patriarchates inside of the Roman Empire at this point, and uh, just at about this time, one outside of the Roman Empire in Persia. He also appointed dozens of bishops and hundreds, possibly thousands of priests. Again, accounting for exaggeration. That's These are just staggering numbers. Jacob was pretty much responsible personally for rebuilding the ecclesiastical structure of monophysitism in the Middle East and into Persia, and this would carry on for centuries to come. Now, to wrap up Jacob's life, he died en route to meet with Coptic leaders in the 578-ish uh, time period. He died of a sickness going through the Holy Land in a monastery, at the Monastery of Romanus or Cassian, near the modern-day city of Gaza on the Mediterranean. And he was on his way to solidify the relations between Syrian and Coptic Egyptian Monophysites. Why was Jacob Bardeus so important? Now, as we said earlier, Monophysites were on the ropes in the early to mid-500s. Chalcedonians had replaced, persecuted, removed, and otherwise got rid of many of the top-ranking Monophysite bishops. This seriously damaged the Monophysite ecclesiastical structure in the Middle East and even into Monophysite strongholds like Egypt. Jacob Bardeus dramatically changed that equation. Monophysitism was strong again in the Middle East and in the Eastern Roman world in general. By the early 600s, the Chalcedonians were the ones on the ropes. The only holdout really was the Roman papacy, and even they had a difficulty holding the Chalcedonian line. Very clear lines were drawn between Monophysites and Chalcedonians. Room for compromise was shrinking drastically. Some attempts at compromise were made. Ideas like monoenergism and monothaletism, which we will talk about later, but well, not to spoil the story, they, they don't really work out. Another Easterner who we will talk about much more soon, a guy named Maximus the Confessor, and the Islamic armies in the century after Jacob Bardeus are going to change this whole equation again. The first and possibly worst schism in Christian history was deepening and chances of reconciliation became very small and were evaporating very quickly to almost no chance of reconciliation. I hope to talk to you soon about all of these exciting developments in church and papal history and much more. And I thank you very much for listening and look forward to talking to you next time.